Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Well, today I am reading, uh, actually making uh, a second attempt at reading uh, a short story by Raja Tridev Roy. It's titled The Misogamist. After a late show at the Nas, they dropped in at the cafe Aram for coffee. Now at two in the morning, even the tricky of traffic had petered out. Weaving about the Dhan Mandi maze, Akbar took a, com took a comer rather exuberantly and almost climbed over a Dilex Cortina. It was positioned as though the driver had begun to make a right turn but had abruptly given up the idea. Akbar's reflexes were good, his brakes even better. Nevertheless, momentum could not be entirely neutralized and there was a half-hearted collision. Relieved at finding that the cacophonous screeching of the females in the back seat was merely a manifestation of jarred nerves and nothing worse, Akbar got out of his car. By an incredible feat of balance, the lone occupant sat slumped forward on the steering wheel. He was evidently asleep, if alive. When shaken, he promptly slid onto the seat and lay at a grotesque angle. Akbar was overjoyed at finding that he did not have a corpse on his hands, merely a drunk. Come and give me a hand, he called out. We are landed with a dimple Hague in person. An assiduous search revealed only a wallet stuffed with money and an oblique reference to his sartorial tastes. In that, his jacket bore the label of a Savile Row outfitter. They found nothing more. Neither a calling card nor even a driving license. Ruby... Wallop him about a bit, will you? Akbar said, switching off the Cortina's headlights and cutting the engine. To wake him? No, replied Akbar, turning on the parking lights uh, to give yourself some exercise. If that's your sense of humor. Ah, oh, well, I checked the leads, he said to Shahana. See if you can penetrate the fog. I'll let him fix it. Ruby said to her husband, he is responsible. In reply, Akbar opened the bonnet of his car. He had got used to his wife's genius for completely missing the obvious. Tickle his nose, Ruby said excitedly. Here, take my hanky. After tinkering around with the wires, Akbar returned to the women. Something is wrong, he said dolefully. The dashed thing won't start. Shall I sit on his head? Ruby suggested helpfully. Suppose he woke up and saw you? And Shahana whispered. Wide-eyed? Would be too funny for words. Akbar lit a cigarette. Yes, and if he died of suffocation, it would be even funnier. He glared at the man. His face was vaguely familiar, as though he had met him casually at a party somewhere. It's no use. He won't wake for hours. Ruby spoke unctuously to Shahana. He's talking from experience, she said. Akbar smiled in the darkness, recollecting his halcyon bachelor days. What do we do? Ruby inquired helplessly. I'm cert certainly not going to walk ten miles. Akbar corrected her. It's only about a mile to Shahana's. He said, sounding like a cheerleader. Let's start. Quick march. Why don't we use his car? Uh, Shahana said, suddenly breaking her thoughtful silence. Uh, why ever not? Akbar locked his car. Then getting into the cortina, heaved the man's legs out of the way. He fiddled around with a few gadgets to familiarize himself with, then switched on the ignition. He dropped. They dropped Shahana at her father, at her mother's house in the northern end of Dhanmandi and returned home without further misadventures. Very few people knew his full and cumbrous name. Being born in the Georgian era and what is more relevant of Victorian parentage, 
he was saddled with a name that ran into miles and length without meaning was merely sound and fury. It had to have connotations, each with its attendant shades. As a consequence, he was known by the less dignified, if more manageable, coca. As everyone knows, it means baby, but it is not common, gender-wise, that is. Coca was secretly pleased at having read Prester John or some other book of Bacon's because he had found therein a name even longer than his. As near as he could recall, it was uh, Blow Wild de Beastie Fontaine. Coca did not know whether it was fictitious or saturated with wild beasts and fountains nor did he get ulcers trying to find out. A name, after all, was a proper noun, even if its possessor was not animate. Coca belonged to that strata of society, which is fondly or enviously labelled idle rich. Whether the rich are idle or industrious is a debatable point. That Coca was rich beyond redemption was an incontrovertible fact. If he dared compete with a camel in a hypothetical obstacle race to heaven, he would undoubtedly be left at the starting point. The camel would effortlessly dive through the needle's eye, execute a jubilant somersault and look back at Coca with disdain and correctly evaluating his rival's progress as no better than a tortoise's, the camel would curl up for a siesta. Impartial observers considered Coca not only idle, but lazy. When he toned it down to ease-loving, they said it was euphemism per se. In born even as a boy, he had shown predilection to self-indulgence self and as an overgrown uh, or as an ingrown or inborn disinclination for work. He had matriculated at the age of 20 and in the third division. How he got through university with a first class master's degree at that was a mystery neither his professors nor he could divine. A stern father with imagination enough to provide checks and balances, bank account wise as well, uh, with a seasoning of disincentives thrown in here and there, no doubt contributed toward his later academic distinctions. When his father died, Coca found himself in clover and Contrary to expectations, he displayed business acumen to the extent of doubling his not inconsiderable inheritance in less than five years. When an amazed friend asked how a congenital lazy bones like him managed such a feat, Coker's explanatory reply was embellished with a military simile. A general plans battles, he said profoundly. He doesn't muck around trenches. He had found his meteor in life in what he termed the joys of existence, and he had a flair for writing. Two one-act plays and three novels still fetched a tidy sum in royalties every now and again. A friend described the phenomenon with a colorful analogy. He said it was like carrying sackfuls of sand to the Sahara. Another illustrated it unoriginally, if aptly, with teli mathe tel, which transliterated means oil on an oiled head. In the early stages, his style was a trifle stifled and the most natural situation seemed contrived. His characters too showed an unhealthy propensity to immerse themselves in too many and often absurd complications. 
extricating them from one sorry predicament merely led them to let them into another. When tired of their antics, he took the shortest way out for them and for himself by killing them off, left, right and center. And with the unceremonious exit of the characters, the stories were left with no option save suicide. In time, however, his writings matured and he even developed a distinctive style of his own. And judging by the sale figures, he seemed to go down well with the reading public. Though formerly he belonged to one of the organized religions, professedly he was an agnostic. In crisis, how, however, he promptly turned deist. He cherished his single man's estate and now at 46, some dubbed him as a misogamist. Thus far, he had managed to short circuit the machinations of an elderly aunt who mercifully, mercifully did not descend on Dhaka too often. The aged relative wanted him to settle down and carry on the line. In reply, Coca cited statistics on food and population imbalance and tried to sound pious in refraining from aggravating it. She, however, dismissed such arguments as irrelevant and frivolous. Providence perhaps did not intend him to adorn or clutter his life with a wife which he equated with strife. Nevertheless, he was reputedly not averse to feminine society in general and intelligent and vivacious women between 18 to 40 in particular. His only stipulation was that any given relationship should not become intractable. As a result of experience, lucky escapes in his mind, Coca had augmented his defense-oriented arsenal with another weapon. In non-technical parlance, it simply meant minimizing social intercourse with personable young women bachelors. If, however, any of them did not consider bachelordom as merely a transitory phase of life, he welcomed her as a comrade in arms and would offer to share even a blanket of his bed. In the form of a baffle, in the form of a baffle wall, he made it a point to let it be known, overtly or covertly, that he was a married man and that his wife lived at home in a non-existent village in Dinajpur district. If specifics were asked for, he had no special favorites among districts. Uh, uh, so, according to the dictates of strategy, he rotated them. It was Sunday morning. Shahana started the record player and settled down with the novel when the phone rang. He's still out like a light, cousin Ruby said without preliminaries. Isn't it crazy bringing home a drunk like that? He might be a crook for all you know. Don't be so unkind, Shahana. Somebody may have doctored his drink. Still the Alice in Wonderland. It will be fun puzzling out the jigsaw together. Why don't you come? All right, because I am curious too. Ruby laughed. And he is handsome too, isn't he? Is he? Stop acting. I caught you looking at him more than once. Simple curiosity. He is old, isn't he? Come and find out, Ruby said. Has auntie taken the car out? No, it's here. I'm coming then. Bye. Koka was floating back to consciousness. About midway, he stopped the process and called out for the bearer. When the familiar sound of a lower teacup and the tinkle-tinkle of a stirring spoon did not eventuate, even in the languor of half-sleep, he sensed that something was decidedly odd. With his habitual reluctance, he opened eye, a lazy eye. 
it did not register in a flash, but a time did arrive when objects ceased to blur. After frantic communications between his brain and nerves, nervous system, a semblance of reality dawned on his mind. He looked around the room with a furrowed brow, furrowed brow neat, he thought, even tastefully restful, but where the dickens am I? He stretched out a lamb or two and discovered that he was still in his lounge suit, though someone had considerately removed his shoes and loosened his tie. Croker tied his laces and opened the door at the farther end of the room. In silence, he surveyed the terrain. At one end of the drawing room, he saw a man, his face hidden behind a book. In the antipodes, he noticed a woman knitting away like a default. The third, another female, was in the midst of a yawn. Her hand still covered her mouth, but the expression in her eyes changed as she cut the yawn off halfway. Hello, Koka said and wancing. I am the man who slept in the next room. As a maiden speech, it was not exactly brilliant, so it evoked no plaudits. Three pairs of curious eyes remained on him. No one spoke. Well, thanks awfully. I mean, for fishing me out of the ditch or something. Most grateful, really. With a little nod, he quickly headed for the sunshine. That's all right, Akbar said, climbing out of his deep armchair. He held out a hand. Uh, the name's Akbar. Please sit down. My wife and cousin Shahana, then Akbar sketched a summary of the events relating to Khoka's be becoming a guest. He glossed over a detail here and diluted another there. The guest, he said, had been sleeping in his chair. You must have been tired, he ended politely, and, his, and this ruby gave, away, gave way to an unladylike splutter. Uh, sorry to have caused all this bother, Koka said uh, contritely, uh, curbing his own impulse to laugh. Uh, I really am, must have been absolutely sozzled. He repressed uh, an impulse to attenuate the damning admission to explain that it was not to be construed as his normal bedtime practice, but he thought it would sound lame. So as so much bravado. He declined breakfast, but stayed up for a cup of tea. As a token of gratitude, he invited them to dinner at his house. Tuesday was agreed upon. So, you are a professor? No, only a lecturer at a private college, Shahana said with a little smile. I thought you were a student. And what's your subject? History. My wife used to teach history too, but of course she only taught high, taught high school. She looked uh, at her host. Doesn't she teach now? Koka smiled, lowering his uh, voice an octave. He said, got kicked out. You are pulling my leg. No fears, it's a fact. Koka lit a cigarette and dug himself deeper into his chair. Threw a duster at a girl. And she didn't miss, he shrugged. Her aim was good through constant practice at home. You don't mean, Shahana's voice faded away. She gave him a quick, sharp glance, but his expression was reflective, even somber. You must have deserved it, she said politely. Perhaps, agreed Koka and sighed. Well, I suppose one shouldn't speak ill of the absent, but she's my own wife, after all. Anyhow, it's all in the past. Now she is an angel with sprouting wings. He excused himself, chatted with another guest or two, and came back. As I was saying, she literally developed her wings, uh, too fond of potatoes and sugar. Uh, I should like to meet her, Shahana said, wondering what she was like to look at. Doesn't she come to Dhaka? She does. Uh, not very often, though. Uh, this place gives her the creeps, she says. But I wouldn't recommend you meeting her. 
Why not? Shahana looked at him sharply. If she knows I am friendly with you, no, even as an acquaintance, she'll straight away think the worst. But why? She feels that married men can't have women friends as friends only. I mean, bachelor women. According to her, anything could happen. Sort of an un, sort on, sort of on unplatonic lines. Shahana took a sip of coffee and remained silent. If you do meet her with me, just freeze into a complete stranger. Certainly not. Why should I? She sounded indignant at his veiled offer of complicity. Uh, to save me from dusters and explanations, uh, I would have to confess I was uh, bloto and you carried me indoors. She could not help smiling. Uh, that way, you say it one word thing only, I was there and I literally carried you into bed or something. She paused then, recollecting, said, but then you said she is an angel now. In all respects, save women and me. Women and you. Yes, friends who are friends first and women second, if you get me. And also the other way around. Shahana accepted more coffee and coca cognac. Tell me, Shahana, he said, cutting a cigar, how is it that you are not married? She gave him a sidelong glance. Isn't that a personal question? Uh, our discussion so far hasn't been entirely weather-oriented, you know? She could not dismiss the force of logic. Because I didn't choose to, she said and clamped up. A most revealing answer indeed. Thank you. The Grundig uh, ceaselessly poured out music uh, at a low pitch. Guests conversed in twos and threes. Shahana realized she had sounded snooty perhaps even haughty, so she elucidated, well, I haven't met anyone I could love yet. That's faulty reasoning. Koka said quickly, never marry for love. Then what, for money? Among other things, such as, he must be totally incapable of intelligent and stimulating conversation. Why are these negative qualities so important? Koka looked at her quizzically uh, to help him on the straight and narrow. Uh, I must say, Mr. Koka is more than adequate, he interposed quickly. What I was saying is your views are peculiar, Shahana stood up. Excuse my saying so and uh, so are you. Good night. And thank you. She walked away briskly and merged into a threesome near the door. Koka smiled inwardly and sipped his cognac before resuming rotation among his guests. From early childhood, Shahana knew her mind. She seldom pre uh, prevaricated and when she wanted something, she usually got it. She was positive. If the road to her objective was paved with ob obstacles, she did not go around them. She bulldozed through. She was serious, sober and sensitive. Through her sense of humor, uh, though her sense of humor was a trifle cramped, she enjoyed a joke like anybody else. Though highly intelligent, her mind tended to run in set grooves. She was extremely pleasing to look at and Impolite people did stare at her lingeringly, with or without the flimsiest excuse. Many a man had tried to woo her, but thus far none had succeeded in making an inroad into her heart. Now, for the first time in 24 years, she experienced doubts and misgivings. She had been in Koka's company a number of times in the last three months. At times, she thought she positively hated him. At the Intercontinental Hotel on the Saturday previous, for an example, 
Koga was in the Chambeli room with a busty woman who looked at him with liquid eyes as though he were the last male left on earth. On the dance floor he had said, Hello Shahana, and she had hallowed back. The exchange was as fleeting as passing ships in mid-ocean. Never once had he come over to her table nor asked her to dance. Was she in love or was she not? Something deep within said she was. And with the admission, she blushed like a cloud at sunset. She asked herself if, if it was right and proper. The answer was a vehement negative. A libertine and a cynic, and well on the wrong side of 40. It's a hopeless case. But then, am I going to languish like a love-lorn ninny? Am I a defeatist? Certainly not. But then, what is the solution? Marriage? One should certainly not bust up a marriage. That's playing dirty. But then, all is fair and even mentally she skipped the word and war. No, it's not fair, but he is the one. I want and I am... The telephone jingled her out of her reverie. Hello. Hello, deep water fish. Whatever do you mean, uh, Ruby? Shahana said listlessly. You know, you sound like a duck in, in travail. I've got a head. Yes, but you've lost your heart. Look, Ruby, reserve the denials for ostriches like yourself. Listen, I've been scouting round and found out something. What are you talking about? Coca, he is not married. What? With a typical sense of dramatic, Ruby put down the telephone receiver. In the midst of preparing for the morrow's lecture, Shahana found her thoughts straying to Coca. Wait, she thought, clenching her teeth. Wait, dusters, I'll show you dusters. Always one to translate feeling into action with promptitude, she picked up the telephone. On the third attempt, she got Coca. Hello, is that you? Not if you are a creditor. What are you doing? Listening to you. I have something to say to you, she said grimly. So it appears. What are you doing this evening? Any number of things uh, contingent upon? I must see you. Can you come over? With pleasure. Midnight suit you? Seven. And seven means exactly 60 minutes after six. He knew better than to argue. After some general conversation, Shahana's mother went upstairs. So you lied to me, Shahana said without preamble. Very likely. Polite society expects one to tell so many lies that it's difficult to know when to speak the truth, if at all. Now you speak the truth. Naturally, now I am not in polite society. She chose to ignore the remark. Why did you lie? Which particular white lie are you referring to? White? It's jet black, about being married and dusters. Coca was seized with proxism of laughter. When it was spent, he said, uh, when I told you that it was not a lie, you see, I conceived myself, I had a wife with a propinquity for dusters, uh, just a question of uh, projecting myself into a future I wish to avoid and still do. Will you cut out the tomfoolery and talk plain? And if you are so, if you are not careful, you'll really have dusters, or better still, flying saucers at you. She glared at Coca, and then at the pile of quarter plates and teacups. She was not thinking metaphorically at all. Coca discovered in alarm. So you are trifling with my affections. So you were trifling with my affections, were you? And laughing at me all the time? Certainly not. You said you hated me. So I said I loved you. I was trying to find a balance in our relationship. Then you didn't mean it. 
Of course, I meant it. He lit another cigarette. But love by its very nature is Catholic, esoteric, never exclusive. Love, after all, is an, is an expendable commodity and expendable too. You are not a man, not a real one. You are completely heartless. I thought a heart that produced a lot of love was soaked in it, in fact, would meet the approbation of mankind, women inclusive. You are not only heartless, you are callous and you are an insulting boor. Don't speak to me ever again. Good night, she stood up. I don't want any politeness from you. Koka had risen with the intention of leaving, but at, but at her words, he quickly sat down again. What are you waiting for? Shahana said. The following evening, Koka decided to stay in. He settled down in bed with a Harold Robbins and a bottle of scotch. He had got through the second drink when the doorbell rang. After sunset, as a matter of principle, he made it a point to answer the door himself. So he put on a dressing gown and shambled off in his slippers. It was Ruby. Aren't you busy by the looks of it? That's right. Coke? Seven up, seven up will be fine. Uh, thank you. Coca gave her the drink and fished out a fresh bottle of whiskey from the cabinet. When is Akbar returning? He asked, raising his glass in a silent toast. He's expected back tomorrow. He patted her hair and with a pensive look, she said, Shahana is in love with you. What are you going to do? Koka drank some whiskey and said nothing. She will make an excellent wife. It's not, it's got nothing to do with her, but being my cousin or anything. Any, and many a man would give his eye teeth for her. I'm sure, Koka said, lighting a cigarette. But can you imagine me as a husband? She would wilt in three weeks and hate my guts in the process. She tried to talk him out of his views, but did not succeed. Then they changed the subject. Hello, turtle doves, Shahana said, materializing with the abruptness of a genie. Billing and cooing, I see. Subdued lights, hushed voices, almost like a movie. Don't be silly, Ruby, Ruby said severely. Come and sit down. What will you have? Koka asked automatically. Your head, Shahana replied, on a silver charger. Done, Koka said cheerfully. But you have got the sequence wrong, being the dance first. Shahana sat down. Ruby? I would never have believed it of you. Disgusting. Ruby flushed and her bright humorous eyes darkened. That's enough, Chahana. Is it? That's all be for Akbar to judge. That's all be for Akbar to judge. Turning to Koka, she hissed, slimy snake. You are not serious, Koka said. I mean, about telling Akbar a pack of lies. I will tell him exactly what I... Koka, Akbar's bound to believe her. Ruby began to cry. Still snuffling, she got up and went out, the, out of the door and into her car. Koka saw her off and returned. Shahana, this farce must stop. He poured himself a stiff shot of the Bacchic nectar. You and I can never get married. So why ruin Akbar and Ruby? Marry you? Shahana snorted. Even if I get marooned on an island with no one but you, I wouldn't marry you. That's natural, he said equally. He said equably. There would be no one to marry us. He drank some whiskey. Incidentally, you may recall that no one married Adam and Eve. Uh, Yet, that didn't stop their carrying on like 
nobody's business and with a clear conscience too. So you want to live like Adam, do you? No, he said perfunctorily, digging and delving to strenuous and strenuous a pursuit, and he only had Eve. With a, wist, with a wistful air, he added, but I wish women didn't cultivate this marriage fad so much. While on the subject, I might, might as well tell you that I have thought things over. She dimpled prettily. I have come to tell you that you are forgiven and that I shall marry you. Koka finished his drink and switched on the music. Since you are talking like an adult, he said slowly, I may as well tell you that you shall not. We will see. She sounded perfectly self-assured, even complacent. Koka looked at her and thought she looked like the cat that had swallowed a canary. And he identified himself with the late canary. Drastic measures are called for, he thought, searching for a way out from under the swords of Democles. She gave him a long, oppressive look and departed through the front door. Her car was parked on the road, si on the road outside the compound wall. He saw her into the car and returned with a creased brow. He started thinking. The idea struck him in the midst of desert, and he wondered why he had not thought of such a simple and obvious solution earlier. He pushed back his chair and strode to the telephone. He dialed PIA and jotted down the flight information. I'll send you instructions later, Koka said to his servant. I am going on a business trip. Where to, Sahib? Initially to blow Vida Bisti Fountain, he said. Now pack a couple of suitcases quickly and wake me up at six sharp. When Shahana rang the house the next day, the servant told her that the master had gone to bloody big Fanta. For a while she felt numbed. Then she picked up the telephone. Ruby, he's gone, the coward, and I feel all carved up inside. Ruby gripped the telephone and could not speak for a moment. He'll come back, she said finally. He must. Shahana sighed and put the telephone down. She did not know that Ruby was not speaking to her, merely voicing a solace to ease her own deep hurt. So that was Raja Tri Dev Roy. Uh, and this reading was a tribute to his... Uh, great loyalty with Pakistan. He chose to live in Pakistan after uh, East Pakistan became Bangladesh and uh, he died in uh, Islamabad some maybe uh, eight years ago. So thank you for watching.